guys, it's Ramon from The Guitar Show. We're going to be looking at the history of the Gibson Explorer. We have to mention Ted McCarty, who presided over Gibson during what would be the most innovative and exciting period in the company's history. In the 1950s, Fender had shaken up the guitar making establishment with its bold solid body designs. Gibson had responded with the Les Paul, a highly effective instrument. For some critics, the Les Paul was simply not radical enough. As Ted McCarty, the firm's former president, admitted in an interview, 1996, he said, Other guitar makers were saying that Gibson was a fuddy-duddy old company without a new idea in years. This information came back to me, so I said we would shake them up if that's what they thought. McCarty quickly commissioned sketches for some brand new designs, and these resulted in drawings and specifications which were to form the basis of some of the wildest-looking instruments in Gibson's history. So the story starts in June 1957, when three applications for design patents were made by Gibson. As you can see from this patent filed by Gibson, um, this was kind of like the first incarnation of a Gibson Explorer, although this model actually became later known as a Futura. This was actually quite a rough drawing, and although it shows two humbucking pickups, two pneumatic bridge plus tailpiece, there are actually no um, controls, pickguard or fingerboard markers. So this patent was actually part of three patents which were filed by Gibson under the name Modernistic Guitars. The other guitars were the Gibson Flying V and the Modern. So unlike any preceding guitar, the Futura featured a dramatic angular body shape. Its heavily extended treble horn counterbalanced by a similar protrusion at the opposite corner of the body. The headstock design was also unusual. Its headstock was V-shaped and housed three tuners on each leg. Gibson first showcased their new Futura guitar at the 1957 NAMM show. In this photo we can see a Gibson employee showcasing this new guitar known as the Futura. It looks to me as if it was a dummy guitar with no controls, so it was probably just used to gauge um, people's opinion. Interestingly, a gentleman by the name of Linhoff turned up with a genuine 1957 Gibson Futura prototype in San Antonio, Texas in the mid-1970s. It was owned by a blues musician named Ponte Guitar Gonzalez Jr., who used it as a decoration in the back window of his customised Cadillac. When Lin Hoff found the guitar, it was stored outside Ponte's house in a hefty trash bag. The guitar's body was made of Carina and turned nearly black by the heat and the sunlight. The neck was made of mahogany. It had no Gibson logo on the headstock and the glued-on pickguard had no screw holes. It was in horrible condition, but it was a real thing. So Gibson actually only made a few of these guitars, possibly only four or five. And these were made between 1957 and early 1958, using firstly Mahogany and then later Carina. The Flying V went into production around April 1958. The Modern did not actually go into production, and the Explorer started to be produced around July 1958. Both the Flying V and the Explorer were first listed at $257.50. Fitted cases were $75. The delivery terms for an Explorer were 60 days as opposed to 30 days for a Flying V. Less than a year later, both the Flying V and the Explorer were withdrawn from the Gibson catalogue. According to Gibson Records, only 22 Explorers were shipped between 1958 and 1959. Although the modernistic guitars were actually a spectacular failure for Gibson, in terms of publicity derived from the project, um, it was actually probably worth the expense in retrospect. Several Flying Vs were bought by dealers in the late 50s to be hung in the shops as an attraction rather than to be sold to customers. And quite possibly that could also be the case for the Explorer. At $247.50, this put it exactly the same price as the Les Paul Gold Top. And interestingly, a Fender Stratocaster was actually more expensive at $274.50. Let's talk about the Carina wood. It's actually an American trademark for a West African hardwood. And this wood is usually known as limber or African limber wood. It's uh, comparable to mahogany because of its average weight and its tonal characteristics, but it's from a different species and family. And I personally would say it's got a bit more high end when compared to mahogany. Gibson actually delayed the launch of the Explorer because it had to make some modifications to the original Futura prototype. Those modifications are pretty obvious to see. It's got a slightly wider waist. I think it's a bit more pleasing to the eye than the Futura. For construction, it used a Carina body and neck and had a white, black, white plastic pickguard, 22 fret rosewood fingerboard with dot markers and a scale length of 24 and three quarter inches. A control layout of two volumes, single tone, a pickup selector and of course Gibson's two humbucking pickups. 
Gibson actually made at least one Explorer with the split V headstock, um, which was retained from the earlier Futura design. But after this, all the headstocks had this kind of hockey stick drooping sort of headstock. And this could have been a nod to Fender style of headstock. This was a pretty radical guitar design at the time, and it must have created an impression, whether good or bad, for everyone that came across it. So according to Gibson's records, only 19 were actually made in 1958. And that's compared to 81 Flying Vs. In 1959, Gibson actually only shipped three examples. So judging by the amount they actually shifted, this guitar was an absolute failure for Gibson when it was first introduced. Or could it be that Gibson was just far too ahead of its time? Let's just talk about an interesting uh, construction point here. The earliest explorers were routed in a very similar way to, a, say, for example, the Les Pauls, utilising a plate on the back for the toggle switch. And halfway through the production run, the electronics were then available through the front of the guitar through the scratch plate. So due to the unpopularity of the Explorer and the Flying V, the factory actually got saddled with a load of stock parts. I'm now going to quote you Ted McCarty. Um, he's talking about Flying Vs, but I think he's also really including the Explorer as well. We stocked production on them for I don't know how many years. The Flying V was put together in two pieces. We made the two wings, as I called them, separate, and we had an inventory of these things. They were around the factory for a long, long time, and it wasn't until the 60s that we dug them out, put them together and made them. So this is where the Gibson records get vague. Some entries in factory ledgers, as well as documented instruments, suggest that a few modernistic guitars were sold after 1959, right into the early 60s. At least one Explorer base was built from bodies held in stock and fitted with an EBO-style pickup and hardware. So although all these post-1959 Explorers do not show up in factory shipping totals. They do actually exist. That said, if we do take into account the serial number sequences, it's estimated that less than 20 Explorers were assembled and sold between 1960 and 1963. The Explorer was eventually reissued in 1975, although it had a mahogany body instead of a Carina body. At this time, Gibson made the claim that only 38 originals were built in the late 50s. Okay guys, let's talk about some notable Gibson Explorer players. I don't know about you, but the first person that comes to my mind is Eric Clapton. So Eric purchased this guitar from Alex Musical Instruments in New York in the early to mid 70s. It's believed to have been made in 1958. One of the main uh, features of this guitar is that it seems to have a shortened bass bout. And uh, Clapton actually believed that this was a result of it being a prototype guitar. When he found out that it had actually been modified, he was um, not happy about that and tried to return it to the guitar store. He used this guitar on the album EC Was Here, which was released in 1975. Possibly this guitar now resides in a private collection in Japan. Eric actually owned a second 1958 Gibson Explorer, serial number 84541. Eric said that he bought this guitar via his manager, Roger Forrester, from a fan in Aston, Texas in 1983. He has used it on stage and is photographed playing it during the arms concert at the Royal Albert Hall, London, September 21st, 1983. So Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick is another guitar player synonymous with the use of Explorer type guitars. And according to himself, he actually owns a pair of these and is the only person to do so in the world. In 1990, he bought his first one from the Dallas Guitar Show. The second, which is a more beat up Explorer, which is the favourite of his two, he bought in 1981 from Larry Briggs at Strings West in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That guitar has a neck joint repair that you can see at the heel or if you look into the neck pickup cavity. The next Explorer player is Alan Collins from Leonard Skinner. And uh, I remember listening to them when I was really, really young and just loving um, Collins' tone. It was just really, really exciting. Um, basically, he got hold of a 1958 Gibson Explorer in 1976. He bought this guitar for $3,000 and used the guitar throughout his tenure with the Alan Collins band. Now, there's a few folk on the internet that are saying that he bought it from Eric Clapton. And whilst this could possibly be true I don't think it is because let's face it Gibson Explorers were really really rare and there's only like 90 made in 1958 so Clapton just having one would have been a really rare thing. Eric's guitar had of course been modified in the lower bout. Collins Explorer was an unmodified guitar and it came with a Maestro Vibrala fitted as well. So lastly another great player who used a 1958 Gibson Explorer was Rick Derringer. Apparently this guitar was sold to him by George Groon and originally it came with silver capped 60s knobs and nickel hardware. As we learned earlier, only the first guitars made actually had the split headstock version. As you can see from these photos, Rick has actually installed Dimasios and probably changed the machine heads. 
Okay, guys, that's it from me. Going to really look forward to your comments on this one. I'm going to be back real soon with George Harrison's history of his guitars. Until then, God bless. See you soon. Hasta la vista.